It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we ask that we uh, stand down our lead questions, uh, please. The lead questions are to be stood down for the official opposition. It's now time for the continuation. A point of order for the uh, no, not a point of order. Uh, the member from Timmins, James Bay. And Mr. Speaker, as well, we'll be standing down our leads awaiting the premier. We we do require consent to stand down. So I'm going to seek unanimous. Yes, I, I'm I'm now heard that the the, the lead is also stood down uh, requested to be stood down by the third party. So now our consent will be to stand down both leads. Do we agree? Agree. Agree. I will now turn the rotation to. One moment, please. I have been informed. I have been informed that the deputy premier will be responding to questions to the Premier today. So I will now, I will now request that the um, unanimous consent actually be rescinded. Uh, let me be clear, excuse me. Let me be clear about that. I mentioned this once before. It is a considered courtesy to notify. Uh, that has been the tradition, and it does not make a requirement to attend. So I'm going to, to repeat myself that indications, the indication is that the Deputy Premier will be made available to answer questions that were intended for the Premier. I'm offering the opportunity to rescind, to rescind the unanimous consent to stand down, providing the Leader of the Opposition and the Leader of the Third Party to put their questions, their lead questions. I'm, I'm now going to uh, turn to the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition for questions. My questions to uh, the uh, Acting, uh, acting Premier, and I'm sure it will be an act. Over the last few weeks, uh, Deputy Premier, the official opposition has laid out five commitments that we are asking to be included in tomorrow's budget. Cancel the Ontario Registered Pension Plan payroll tax because it will kill jobs. Cancel the pay-to-pollute carbon tax that will increase the price of everything in the province. Fix the home care system and improve home care services while tying community care access centre funding to outcomes. Commit to reducing electricity prices in the province. Finally, we ask that you provide a serious, credible and detailed plan to balance the budget. Deputy Premier, will you commit to these five requests in tomorrow's budget? Thank you. Uh, speaker, clearly the answer is a resounding no. We are absolutely committed to moving forward on retirement security for Ontarians, and I, for the life of me, don't understand why you would support you would not support enhanced retirement security for seniors. Speaker, we are moving forward with a balanced plan. I know we're all looking forward to seeing the uh, the budget tomorrow, Speaker, uh, but we have a plan to get back to balance and at the same time invest in those much needed infrastructure projects that will lift Ontario up, Speaker. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Premier, your own internal finance ministry documents have told you that the Ontario Registered Pension Plan will cost the province at least 18,000 jobs. The pay-to-pollute carbon tax will spike the price of gas and increase the price of everything. Patients and their families are finding extremely difficult accessing home care through the CCACs. Electricity prices are set to rise 15 per cent on May 1st, in addition to the 42 per cent increase over five years that we already know about. And let's be serious. No one, no one believes you have a plan to balance the books by 2017-2018. Rising interest payments on that debt means less money for important frontline services like health care and education. The auditor in a recent report said exactly that. 
Premier, will you take our Deputy Premier, will you take our advice? Question. And stop gouging Ontarians who can't afford to pay any more than they already are. Thank you. Well, Deputy Speaker, I, I do respect the clarity of the party opposite, uh, but we do reject uh, we reject the uh, the approach that you are taking. We had an election, Speaker, uh, less than a year ago. This uh, different way of moving forward was debated. The people chose to go with the Liberal Party because we had a plan to move forward, Speaker, investing in much-needed infrastructure, investing in the things that, that people need in our education system, in our health care system. Please finish. Uh, speaker, our, our plan is thoughtful, it is pragmatic, and we are moving forward on implementing that plan. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Premier. Ontarians know your budget will result in skyrocketing electricity prices and attacks on everything. Cuts to nursing and home care will continue. 249 nurses have been fired since last year's election when the Premier promised health care services would be protected. Schools are closing and teachers are being fired despite the Premier's election promise that teachers wouldn't lose their jobs. Private sector jobs are being lost across most sectors of the province, of the economy, because it has become too expensive. Minister of Economic Development, come to order. And the cost. Excuse me. Stop the problem. Leader. Leader. While he was uh, in the middle of his argument, I asked the member to come to order. In case he didn't hear it, the Minister of uh, Economic Development, Trade and Infrastructure will come to order. <coughs> and whoever decides to want to be my armchair quarterback will also be warned. Carry on. Clearly, private sector jobs are being lost in many sectors of the economy. You can't, you can't deny that. You're living, in, you're living in wonderland if you deny it. The Minister of Economic Development will come to order, and he's inches away from a warning. Carry on. So, Deputy Premier, why won't you commit to our budget ask that will give hardworking Ontarians financial relief, better home care, and a credible plan to keep and create jobs in this province? Deputy Premier. Well, Speaker, uh, we are all looking forward, as I said, to tomorrow's budget, and what we will see is a plan to continue to uh, uh, promote the uh, expansion of our economy in Ontario. You know, the member opposite, the member who ran on the platform of firing 100,000 people, Speaker, is now talking about, uh, uh, about concern about job losses. Where was that concern in the last election campaign? The member knows full well as a former Minister of Health. Uh, he's watching, I'm sure, carefully. We have 24 thousand more nurses working in Ontario You can point to individual situations. I will repeat myself a second time for the member from dufferin Caledon, the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, and the member from Simcoe North. Come to order. Finish, please. To the heckling. 24,000 more nurses working, working, employed. The member from Simcoe North, second time. Carry on. Uh, let me repeat. 24,000 more nurses are working in Ontario now than when you left office, Speaker. I know the member opposite doesn't actually believe that number, and we would be happy to, to give you those numbers. It is the truth, Speaker. They don't like it. They want us to cut nurses. We are not going to do that. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Nipissing. Thank you. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. You grew our deficit from $9.2 billion to $10.5 billion and now to $10.9 billion this year. You're headed the wrong way. You're getting farther away from balancing, not closer. You turned our once proud province into an economic wreck. We have the highest energy costs in come North order. America. We have the highest payroll taxes in Canada. Since you turned us into a have-not province, you've received $14 billion in equalization payments from the federal government, and you still can't balance the budget. You're failing our youth hurting our seniors and putting families in an ever-deepening hole. 
Why should anyone believe you can balance a budget when you can't even reduce your own deficit? Thank you, Deputy Premier. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, we have a very clean, uh, very clear plan to uh, balance the budget by 2017-18, and tomorrow's budget will demonstrate how we are taking those next steps, Speaker. I can tell you that in 2014-15, our government is once again beating our deficit tar target, Speaker. We have done that year after year. The result is $25 billion less in debt than originally projected, Speaker. So we have a responsible plan. We have a balanced plan. We have a plan that invests in our people, that invests in our infrastructure, as we take responsible decisions to get best value for the money, Speaker, that we spend in this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, to the deputy, every expert has spoken out about the sorry state of Ontario's finances all under your watch. Our latest release, Focus on Finance, puts Ontario under a microscope, and no one is happy with what it reveals. The Auditor General said, quote, Ontario's debt continues to grow faster than the province's economy. The result is what she calls a crowding out of other spending. We now have less money for the things our citizens expect from the province. We're starting to see frontline cuts in health care and education, just as the Auditor General warned. Later today, our interim leader, Jim Wilson, will present our yes, Opposition Day yes, motion with five budget asks designed to help Ontario's families. Question. Will you agree to change your downward path and support our motion? Thank you. Uh, you see it, please? You see it, please? Uh, yes, that's pretty interesting. The member from Oxford, come to order. Quirk. So the, the opposition party continues to tear to Ontario down, calling us an economic wreck. That is simply not accurate. Our plan, in stark contrast, is all about building Ontario up, Speaker. We are committed. To uh, continue to build that dynamic, innovative, competitive business environment, we will continue to invest in our people, Speaker. Particularly, uh, young entrepreneurs and young people who are working on that transition from from uh, school to work, Speaker. Uh, we we absolutely are committed to in building up our infrastructure. For too long, if the appropriate investments Member have not Prince been made in our infrastructure, we're addressing that, Speaker. And we are going to continue to ensure that the hardworking people of Ontario have the retirement security that they deserve. Yes, I would suggest you look at our plan and join us in this fight, Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, to the deputy. Earlier this week, we asked that you present a serious, credible, and detailed plan to balance the budget. Instead, we continue to see frontline cuts, Speaker. Everyone in this legislature has examples. So let me give you some from my hometown of North Bay. 94 full-time and 34 part-time frontline health care workers, including nurses, have been fired in North Bay. More than 54 people at Nipissing University, including 22 professors, have been fired in North Bay. 43 workers from Ontario Northland have been fired in North Bay. Your wasteful and scandalous mismanagement of our budget is reducing services and putting the most vulnerable at risk. When will you present a serious, credible, and detailed plan to balance the budget? Thank you. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke come to order. Deputy Premier, Dep uh, the Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Mr. Speaker, I'm glad the member opposite has referred to health care in North Bay because I know he already knows this information. I want to share with the rest of the legislature that on Monday, three health organizations uh, it was announced that they will receive uh, funding for this uh, fiscal year, Mr. Speaker. And the reason this announcement was made, in fact, this announcement was made by the member opposite. Oh. And quoting, quoting, quoting the North Bay Nugget, Mr. Speaker. The, the funds recently announced 
announced by Nipissing MPP Vic Fidelli will go toward mental health and replacement reserve costs associated with supported housing services in Nipissing. And, and in fact, Fidelli, uh, sorry, the member opposite in a release, extended it. On Monday, Mr. Speaker, he extends his sincere appreciation on behalf of Nipissing residents to our local health care professionals for their own. Thank you. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Last year, the Premier stood in this House and she said she would, quote, look at those assets to optimize the value of those assets, unquote. The Premier has talked about maximization unlocking value and rationalizing assets. The Premier has used just about every word except sell and privatize when it comes to Hydro One Speaker. If the Liberals are so proud of what they're doing, so proud of selling and privatizing Hydro One, why can't they just say the word Speaker? So will the Liberals, this Deputy Premier, tell Ontario today how proud the Liberals are to do what Mike Harris wouldn't dare do? sell and privatize Hydro One. Well, uh, speaker, this government is committed to building the infrastructure that this province absolutely needs. Speaker, Governments of the past have not invested appropriately in infrastructure, which leaves us with a huge infrastructure deficit. So what we are doing is we are unlocking the value of some of our assets, Speaker, so that Remember we can from build that Stony Creek, very important time. transit infrastructure. We were clear about this. This was discussed in the budget prior to the last election. It was included in our election platform. And whether the leader of the third party knows it or not, she ran on it too, because she took all of our fiscal assumptions and embedded them in her platform, Speaker. So we're moving forward. We are expanding the sale of beer and we're broadening ownership of Hydro One. Yes, and at the same time, we are protecting ratepayers, Speaker. Uh, we are creating lasting public benefit to the people. People of this province and the status quo speaker just simply doesn't. Thank you. Supplementary. Speakers, speaker, the Liberals are selling Hydro One, and now they say this is what they ran on. The words sell Hydro One aren't in their platform, neither is privatized, Speaker. They were not even whispered on the campaign trail. The Premier says she's being straightforward with Ontarians. Oh, please. Ontarians were never told of her plan to sell Hydro One. Ontarians were never asked what they think of her plan to sell Hydro One, and they certainly have never signed off on the Liberal plan, the wrong-headed plan that the Liberals have to sell off Hydro One. So, will the Liberals just come out and admit it, just admit it to the people of Ontario? Thank you. Well, you know, Speaker. You seen it, please. You seen it, please. Thank you. Deputy Premier. You know, uh, Speaker, the, the party opposite has been vocal in their criticism, but they have offered no constructive plans on how to pay for infrastructure that we need in this province. So this is not about ideology. This is about finding a solution, a practical solution to a problem. Uh, Speaker, and, and some members of the NDP I know do support this. And uh, former NDP cabinet minister uh, Frances Lankin was on the panel. Uh, she understands that we need to make these investments. Speaker, the powers work. The power workers union are supportive of our plan. They understand that needs. Answer. Leuna, the building trades mayors, councillors across this province are supportive of this plan. It is unfortunate that the leader of the third party can't see beyond the. Thank you. Supplementary. Once the Liberals sell off Hydro One, it is gone. There is no going back, Speaker. As Ontarians watch rates go up uh, and to feed base, base Street profits, they will do so knowing that they will never, ever be able to regain control of their hydro system. It is wrong for our generation, Speaker. It is wrong for our kids' generation, and it is wrong for our grandkids' generation. The, the Premier. 
the Premier is spending more time right now, Speaker, in this province consulting about where to, to sell a 12-pack of Bud than they are about privatizing strategic <laughs> assets like Hydro One. Selling Hydro One is forever, Speaker. The plan is the wrong plan for Ontario. Will the Liberals do the right thing and pull the plug on this plan? Uh, well, Speaker, as a result of that decision to broaden the uh, ownership of Hydro One while protecting the public interest, it is allowing us to invest in infrastructure. Speaker, Moving Ontario uh, Forward Fund is now $31.5 billion over 10 years because we've been able to unlock those assets. Speaker, $16 billion of that will be spent in the GTHA. 15 billion outside the GTHA. <laughs> Speaker, it will go for uh, regional express rail, Hamilton RT, here Ontario uh, LRT. Someone's close to a warning. Carry on, please. It's allowing us to fund the Collecting Links program, Answer. Speaker. Highway 7 between the Member from Stormont, well, Dundas, South I asked the member opposite, what do you want to cut? What don't you want to build, Speaker? Yeah. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The leader of the third party. My next question is also for the Deputy Premier. The Premier's plan is wrong for Ontarians. It is going to mean families who are already stretched are going to be stretched even further. People will be paying more so that a small handful of shareholders can make more money. Every dollar that goes into their pockets is a dollar that doesn't go into hospitals, schools or transit. This will actually cut stable income that goes into projects like building transit, keeping schools open, or building hospitals. Do the Liberals really think Ontarians should keep paying more and more and more and getting less and less and less? Well, Speaker, we just fundamentally disagree with the approach of the third party. We believe in investing in our infrastructure. We believe in investing in, in those uh, projects that actually improve the quality of life for the people of this province. I think that if she went and spoke to the people in Hamilton, they would say that they don't want to spend time caught in gridlock. We must make these investments. We want a throw, growing, thriving economy because it's the right thing to do for people, Speaker. So we are going to move forward. We are moving forward, building the infrastructure that is needed because the people of this province are demanding that. Right, uh, supplementary. Today, Hydro One puts hundreds of millions of dollars into the things that people rely on, Speaker, like hospitals, like school, schools, like infrastructure. But the Liberals are planning to sell Hydro One to Bay Street, and it's going to make a handful of well-connected Bay Street investors even wealthier. Well, Ontarians have to stretch every dollar further just to make ends meet. Deputy House Leader. Privatizing Hydro One is wrong for Ontarians and will actually cut stable long-term revenue. Why do the Liberals think that this is okay? Deputy Premier. Well, so, uh, Speaker, the, the, the member knows that, uh, that part of the work of the panel was to actually look at how you offset the revenue loss. They did that. That's why we're making cha uh, changes in beer distribution, for example, Speaker. But we're not the only ones who think this is a great idea. Don McKinnon, the president of the Power Workers Union, says the Power Workers Union welcomes and supports the decision by government to keep Hydro One whole in an IPO process that would, in partnership with government, broaden the ownership structure of Hydro One. The, this will position the company to grow and provide further high-quality, high-skill quality jobs for Ontarians. Joe Mancinelli, the v vice president uh, uh, at Leuna International, says the Wynn government is to be commended for today's announcement, implementing sweeping changes in our province, which will greatly Answer. benefit all Ontarians. The $4 billion these changes will introduce for investment in Thank infrastructure you. projects. Thank you. Final supplementary. 
The Premier wants to continue to protect private profits through sweetheart P3 deal, Speaker. That's going to waste billions and hurt families. She's opening up brand new HST loopholes, Speaker. That's going to waste billions and hurt families. She's planning to sell Hydro One to Bay Street. It means a cut to provincial revenues, and it's going to hurt families. Nobody cares what the Premier calls this, whether she calls it ideological, non-ideological, the activist centre. I call it a sellout, Speaker. I call it taking hard-earned dollars from middle-class families and struggling Ontarios, Ontarians and dumping those dollars into the pockets of Bay Street uh, boardrooms and, sh and shareholders. That's what this is. It doesn't matter what Question. she calls it, Speaker, because those are the facts. The money is coming out of the pockets of everyday families and going into the pockets of Bay Street shareholders. Thank the plan you. is wrong for Ontario. Thank you. No, Speaker, let's hear what Joe Mancinelli had to say. He said the $4 billion these changes will introduce for investment in infrastructure projects, the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, is welcome news to Leuna and our members. Job creation is one of the key components of this initiative, and we welcome the much-needed infrastructure and the thousands of jobs that will be created for our members for years to come. Uh, speaker, there are many others who are supporting this decision. We've heard the NDP do not support these investments. I think that's a shame because the people of this province need those investments. Very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. I'll go directly to him because I know it's going to get dumped over there anyway. Minister, the speed at which the price of electricity continues to escalate in Ontario under your government is even quicker than your attempt to expedite the sale of Hydro One. Your frantic desire to sell off this public asset clearly suggests and indicates that your government is desperate for money. Perhaps if you weren't recklessly wasting billions of dollars on, fa on the failed gas Minister, rates, expensive wind and energy experiments, and defective smart meters, energy rates would be much more affordable and you wouldn't have to resort to the sale of Hydro One. Minister, why are you continuing to do nothing to lower unaffordable energy rates for ratepayers and businesses here in the province of Ontario? Stop. Sir of Energy. Mr. Speaker, I'm uh, pleased that the member mentioned uh, uh, electricity rates for businesses across the province, Mr. Speaker. One word that the opposition never mentions is conservation, Mr. Speaker. Let me say a few words about conservation. Mr. Speaker, Home Depot has completed 191 conservation projects province-wide. Wow. These have reduced energy consumption by more than 29 million kilowatt hours since 2012, enough electricity to power more than 3,000 typical Ontario homes for a year. Mr. Speaker, order. Tim Hortons, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition will come to order, please. And Thornhill. Did I miss? <laughs> Never mind. Thank you. Finish, please. Mr. Speaker, 245 Tim Hortons restaurants underwent renovations that included energy saving measures like switching to LED lighting and installing white roofs. Through its combined conservation efforts last year, Tim Hortons, uh, it would save around Answer. 4 million kilowatt hours of electricity province wide. Wow. Thank, you. For, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Minister, when the factory closes, their consumption goes down to zero. I guess that's your ultimate conservation plan. Yeah, that's exactly Minister, right. you have got to stop playing games on vulnerable people in Ontario with your energy prices. Yep. One day you announce a minuscule rebate for low-income ratepayers. However, within days, you increase their bills and the bills of everyone else across this province by an unacceptable, unsustainable 15 per cent. This sleight-of-hand shell game of yours has got to stop. People cannot take it anymore. They've had enough of your failed energy experiments here in the province of Ontario. Your negligence has resulted in unaffordable electricity rates, making it more and more difficult for small business, seniors and families to survive in this great province of Ontario. Minister, as one of our PC caucus asked, will you restore competitive electricity rates in Ontario to make them affordable for families, seniors and small businesses? <laughs> 
Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member is aware of the fact that the MDF paper board plant in Pembroke, his riding, Mr. Speaker, is reopening after being accepted into the IEI program, which is a program that supports businesses, Mr. Speaker, creating 140 new jobs for the area in his riding, Mr. Speaker. Atlantic Packaging, Mr. Speaker, from Whitby, is expanding their paper mill and creating 80 jobs with the help of the new IEI program, Mr. Speaker. And Detour Gold says the program will save them $20 million, Mr. Speaker, in one year while they expand what will be one of the largest gold mines in Canada. Mr. Speaker, our rates are competitive on the, on the residential side, Mr. Speaker. There are three provinces who have higher rates than we do. There are two, Manitoba and Quebec, that are considerably lower because of legacy hydro programs. Who when we compare it to cities like Detroit, Boston, and New York, Mr. Speaker, we're considerably below them. In North America, we are are competitive from, from come an north industrial and business point of view and competitive from a residential point of view. Thank you. That's a question. You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. New question. The member from Windsor West. My question is to the Minister of Education. Minister, contrary to Liberal spin, Ontarians know that your government sets the priorities for education in this province. This Liberal government has made it clear that it prioritizes cutting special education and forced closures of neighbourhood schools. Now we're learning that they plan on flip-flopping on their commitment to keep class sizes manageable. Sure. Speaker, why is this government refusing to take responsibility for short-sighted cuts to education, which have resulted in labour unrest and the closure of community schools? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And I, I'm really uh, pleased to share with this legislature that, in fact, education funding is stable. It was $22.5 billion last year. It's $22.5 billion this year, and the number of students have gone down which means the per pupil amount have gone up. But let me tell you about some of the really exciting things that we're doing, Speaker. We have invested $12.9 billion in school infrastructure, including nearly 725 new schools and more than 700 additions and renovations. Wow. Yeah. We've worked to give uh, our students uh, programs like specialist high skills majors, co-op education, dual credits, and we announced just last week that the graduation Answer. rate has now gone up to 84 per cent. We are actually doubling the amount of money this year Thank spent you. on school renovation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to point out to the Minister of Education, you say funding stable. Special education needs have gone up. Hydro rates have gone up, and transportation costs have gone up. Therefore, the funding has gone down. Speaker, back to the Minister of Education. Ontario families are growing tired of a minister who finds her portfolio perplexing. With teachers in Durham on strike, Rainbow District in Northern Ontario to join next week, and now Peel preparing to strike in Deputy May, Premier. this government must take responsibility for throwing our school system into chaos. Why is the minister and her government skirting responsibility for the mess her government's cuts to education have made in our school system? Minister. Yes, thank you. And the member the opposite might be like, interested to know that the lines to pay for utilities has gone up. However, let's talk about Durham, because the member opposite brought up Durham. Let me tell you about Durham. The Durham Public Board is going to receive $729 million in funding for this school year. That's $2 million more than last year. It's $289 million more than in 2003. In fact, it's actually gone up 65% since 2002-03. Let me tell you about the per pupil funding. It's up almost $4,000 in Durham. In fact, 57.4% increase for every single student in Durham. It's now $10,661, Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. New question. The member from Barrie. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Well, you may be. Carry on. My question is to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Speaker, the first Earth Day was held on April 22, 1970. Since then, Earth Day has grown into an international event with 192 countries holding Earth Day events across the globe. Children in the classrooms and daycares in Barrie and around the world will be learning about, about why there is an Earth Day and how they can help save our planet on a daily basis. Earth Day Canada is celebrating their 25th anniversary this year with the goal to engage people across the country in a national effort to reduce their carbon footprint. I'm sure constituents of my riding in Barrie will be pleased to know that thanks to the leadership of this government, on met. Speaker, could you please uh, ask the minister to answer what are some simple things Ontarians can do to reduce their carbon footprint? Thank you, Minister, minister of the uh, Environment. And climate change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Barry, who is a great educator and understands the importance of, of the next generation. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I was out with uh, about 100 children this morning, and there are certain moments in your life you'll never forget, and it was one of them, Mr. Speaker, because I realized as I was looking at those children that they are the first generation, Mr. Speaker, that will never know normal climate. And we are the last generation that will ever know cl climate. And what they were saying to me, Mr. Speaker, and what they wanted to say to members of the legislature, that they ride their bikes, that, that they're, they're living on a planet that's fast heading for four degrees Celsius, and they want us to stop that, Mr. Speaker. They realize we're the last generation that can do that. And this is the 25th yes, an Earth Day anniversary in Canada, Mr. Speaker. We maybe have 25 more Earth Days to get this right, and I'm very proud to be part of a government, Mr. Speaker, that understands that's the first priority of Canadians. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. While it's important that individuals reflect on their carbon footprint and take some simple measures to reduce their impact on the environment, it's equally important that our government continue to show leadership in fighting climate change. Sure, Speaker, sure. I know my constituents are proud of the fact that Ontario was the first jurisdiction in North America to close coal-fired power plants. The, the report confirms our, our the 2013 Air Quality in Ontario report was released a week ago on the anniversary of the last coal plant closure in Ontario. The report confirms our air quality has improved significantly over the last 10 years, and for the first time in 20 years, no. Please finish. Wrap up. Minister, could you inform us what further action this government is taking to fight climate change and reduce greenhouse gas pollution in our atmosphere? Mr. Speaker, the member from the P and Carleton will come to order, and the member from Lanark, Prawnak, Lennox, and Addington is warned. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, I mean, the from Hamilton East, Stony Creek, I can do without the whistling. <laughs> I'm sorry. Whoever was, I'll do without it. I apologize. Member from Anglington, Lawrence. I have a feeling that you have not got the message that I would like a question period as best we can. Please wrap up. Hey, Steve. The question was put. Minister? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, for that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are uh, doing everything from uh, my friend, the Minister of Transportation, working to electrify the entire GO system. Uh, in economic and development, we're global leaders in green technology, low carbon technology. These are very important things, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, come to order. But it was interesting because my friends from. Uh, Timmins James Bay made the reference to dinosaurs who I thought were extinct until I heard some of the positions of the party opposite. The difference between us and uh, 
the, di the difference between us and dinosaurs, Mr. The member from Renfrew. Before I. Uh, Before I make my comment that I was going to make of the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell is warned. I am not impressed with any kind of uh, response that impugns anyone in this place, and it's getting a little ridiculous. So let's just calm down, everyone. I wouldn't want to add anything more to where you are right now. And I would advise anyone that if they do say something that is inflammatory, that they would be kind enough to withdraw. Carry on. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, I sometimes don't think we fully understand how serious this was. Yesterday, Mr. Speaker, the federal government became the first government to completely divest entirely from any dollars or expenditures on climate change, Mr. Speaker, leaving the entire fight on climate change in this country to municipalities and provinces, a, Mr. Speaker. And here we are in the shadow of the worst environmental budget in Canadian history celebrating Earth Day, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Thank you. Question, the member from Bruce Bay, Owen Sound, and the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. North. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Let re me remind you there are approximately 350,000 people over the age of 65 who currently receive home care services in Ontario. They have told us over and over again that their home care system is broken. It is inadequate and inconsistent at best. With our aging population and your fiscal mismanagement, nobody believes the system will be equipped to handle future need. Quality and accessibility will continue to deteriorate. Your expert, Gail Donners, has said, and I quote, everyone is frustrated with a system that fails to meet the needs of clients and families. No one thinks the status quo is an option. Deputy Premier, how much longer do seniors and their families have to wait for you to make the necessary changes to their home care system? Good question. Good question. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Long Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. I know the member opposite knows that we appointed Gail Donner uh, uh, for and, and a team of experts, in fact, uh, to look uh, at home and community care. We did that last year. They presented the report to me at the end of January. That report has been made public. I've also indicated that I've uh, endorsed the recommendations uh, in that report, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, and we agree that more needs to be done for Absolutely. home and community care. That's the express purpose of us. Uh, meeting that table in the first place. So uh, we are taking the recommendations very seriously. Uh, we are uh, continuing to invest in home and community care. Of course, this year, $270 million more dollars invested in yeah. home and community care. That's a 5 percent increase. Uh, but we are looking at uh, the uh, tables, the expert panel's recommendations very seriously, and we will be, be making changes uh, based on those yes, recommendations, sir. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Deputy Premier. The people of Ontario are frustrated. This frustration is being felt by the senior citizen who can't get a personal support worker following a hip replacement. This frustration is felt by a daughter trying to get physiotherapy for her father who recently suffered a stroke. This frustration is being felt by the thousands of people who cannot get the home care services they need. We know the two biggest issues within our system are excessive bureaucracy and a lack of accountability for system outcomes. Yet you continue to ignore the obvious. Deputy Premier, will you make the functional changes to our system that we need in order to improve patient care? Will you tie funding to the Community Care Access Centre so that we can have improved outcomes and patient results? Will you do that, Deputy Premier? You're here. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I said uh, we're making substantial investments in our home and community care sector. More than four billion dollars invested in that sec sector annually, increasing that this year and next year and the year after by five percent. As we continue to provide that uh, high-quality care, accessible, uh, timely care in the place where people uh, want it the most, Mr. Speaker, in their homes or in their communities. And we uh, are making changes. And I would just ask the member opposite. I would hope now that we have Gail Donner's report guiding the way forward with her uh, specific recommendations of her and the team. Uh, I would like to ask the member opposite if we can count on his support as we implement those changes that are required to meet the recommendations and the aspirations that are outlined in that report, That's Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Thank you. A new question. The member from Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Speaker, 
Opsu hospital workers are at Queen's Park today in the gallery. They came to tell us as first-hand witness that the Liberal government cuts to health care is having a devastating impact on quality of care. I'll give you some examples. At Lake Ridge Health Centre, they have to let 20 per cent of their genetic technologists go. They also are laying off their senior technologists in flow cytology. This is the charge tech being laid off. These positions have a direct impact on the patient at the Durham Regional Cancer Centre. In Cornwall, it is 11 per cent of their sonographer that have been cut. Hospitals are facing are forced to reduce or cut these services because of your government cuts. Question. My question is simple. How many more cuts Minister should we Minister Children and Services, Ontario come to order a second time. We'll see in tomorrow's budget. Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'll say this as generously as I can, but the, uh, the facts are, despite what the member opposite has uh, just said, the facts are somewhat different. We are and have been and will be increasing our funding to health care as we have done over the past decade and we will continue to do moving forward. So we invest, it's a, uh, the member opposite knows that we invest more than $50 billion in our health care system annually and that investment, is a significant portion of that investment goes into the hospital environment as well and that investment in our hospitals, our frontline health care workers and the environment that people depend on when they do get ill and require service. That investment in our hospitals in has increased by more than 50 per cent in the last decade, Mr. Speaker. So we are, it is, it is factually incorrect. I would suggest to the member opposite uh, to, st to state that we are not, that we are somehow cutting health care. Health care has for the past decade increased in funding each year and it will continue to do so. Thank you. Yeah. Supplementary. Speaker, it is bad enough that we're seeing health care cuts throughout our province when the minister refused to acknowledge that those cuts are taking place, it's making things worse, not better. This is, this is year three of hospital-based budget freeze. All of them are struggling to balance their budget, and they have no choice but to cut program services and position. The bottom line looks like this. 22 position cuts in Cambridge. In London, 97 position cuts. Sarnia, 39 position cuts. Timmins, 40 position cuts. Sudbury, 42 position cuts. Chio, 50 position cuts. And the brand new hospital in uh, North Bay, 94 full time, 34 part time position cuts. Wow. We all know who pays the price for those cuts. It's the patients who need health care services. Speaker, with the budget coming Question. tomorrow, Will Ontarians continue to see this right-wing austerity health care agenda? How many more cuts to health care can we Thank expect you. to see in tomorrow's budget? Minister well, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite, of course, has her list and I have mine, which is somewhat different. The Ottawa Hospital has 49 RN active postings right now where they're looking for 49 registered nurses to work at that hospital. The Royal Ottawa Health uh, Centre in Ottawa, 15 RNs and one RPN. Active postings today. Uh, the Aurelia Soldiers Memorial Hospital in Aurelia are looking for 10 RNs, Mr. Speaker. Oh. London Health Sciences Centre looking for 10 RNs and three nurse practitioners. Lake Ridge Health Centre, where I had the privilege of announcing a new pharmacy uh, in that hospital, uh, looking for, for seven RNs. Hamilton Health Sciences Centre looking for 16 RNs. Grand River, seven RNs. Blue Water Health System, five RPNs. El Monte General Hospital, two RNs, four, RN, four RNs, and RPNs. Answer. This is the situation around the province. Of course, programs changes, and there are changes that are made at that local level, as they should be, Mr. Thank Mr. You. Speaker, but we are adding health care. Thank you. New question? The member from Newmarket, Aurora. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Rising temperatures and April showers bring spring flowers, but rising temperatures and heavy rains also bring spring flooding. The Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, along with conservation authorities like Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority in my riding of Newmarket Aurora, monitor surface water levels, weather forecasts, water conditions and locations across our watershed. Very These smart. measurements, weather forecasts and, and radar information on temperature and rainfall predictions, along with historical data, data 
are all compiled to develop a flood forecast. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry, can the minister please explain to the House what his ministry is doing to ensure that communities in Ontario are prepared to respond to pot potential Question. flooding emergencies? Yeah. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the, uh, the member for the question. It's topical and timely. Speaker, our ministry works with communities, with conservation authorities and Environment Canada to forecast where and when flooding is likely to occur. The ministry has an information website to inform people in Ontario about potential flooding, provide real-time information about weather and flooding risks, and provide tips on what to do in the event of flooding. Speaker, this piece is very important. Conservation authorities, for people to know on a local level, are responsible for providing local flood messaging to municipalities. In areas where there is not a conservation authority, district offices will provide that information out to First Nations communities and to the local municipalities where a conservation authority does not exist. Our Surface Water uh, Monitoring Centre performs daily assessment for flood hazard potential. The, minister does, uh, the ministry does a variety of things in that regard and Sir? monitors watershed conditions. 24 hours a day. Here, this here. is a significant piece, Speaker, and I want to make sure that communities, conservation authorities, First Nations are aware of what's available to them thank in you. terms of achieving that data. Here, thank here. you. Supplementary. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response and dedication to ensuring that Ontario's communities are as prepared as possible for potential floods. Water levels remain high in parts of Ontario, as is common for this time of year, and we expect high water conditions to continue for several weeks. In northern Ontario, a late spring snow melt accompanied by average, above average snowpack and significant rainfall can lead to flooding. As we know that uh, these floods can shut down roads, flood homes, and in extreme circumstances lead to evacuations, Mr. Speaker, residents from all parts of Ontario need to know that in the event of an emergency such as a flood, that our province has proper response plans in place. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell the House how our government prepares to Question. respond to emergencies such as floods in our province? Question. Thank you, Minister. Speaker, Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Sir, Community Safety and Correctional Services. Thank you, Speaker, and thanks the member from Newmarket Aurora for uh, asking a very important question. Uh, speaker, each uh, spring, many communities across Ontario are confronted with the possibility of flooding as winter snow melts and river ice breaks up. Just last night, the member from Prince Edward and Hastings and I were uh, reminiscing about visiting Belleville last year when uh, they were fi uh, fighting their uh, floods in their community. Belleville. Our most important priority, Speaker, is the safety and security of all Ontarians, and that means well before we begin to enjoy warmer weather, the Office of the Fire Marshal and Emergency Management, also known as OFMEM, prepares host communities to accept evacuees. This ensures that during a flood, people in affected communities have a safe place to go. Throughout the flood season, Speaker Offman maintains regular contact yes, with municipalities and ministries to assess the risk from flooding and ensure we have the most up-to-date information. If an evacuation is necessary, Offman works closely with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry to coordinate uh, fights out of effective communities. Thank you. Thank you. No question, member from here on Bruce. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Last week, you released your new carbon pay to pollute scheme, and your own Premier admitted herself that she was adding a tax. We know that this is because the price of everything will increase. What we don't know are the details on it. Instead, you have left Ontarians in the dark about how much you will be taking out of their wallets. The Deputy dark. Premier, families can't afford to manage their budgets the way you do. They can't run deficits for 11 years and shrug off hundreds of billions of dollars of debt. So, Deputy Premier, will you commit to not implementing another devastating tax onto the people of Ontario? The Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thanks. I, I have, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I actually have a question for the member opposite. When, when, uh, order. Stop. Press. You got two? No, you have to. No, you had to. Thank you. Please finish. 
and I think she might be helpful in helping me understand something, Mr. Speaker, because when her party introduced a cap and trade on NOx and SOx, they didn't call it a tax on everything. When they did it again on mono carbon monoxide, they didn't call it a tax on everything. When the Alberta government, their sister party in Alberta, did it, they didn't call it a tax on everything. Mr. Speaker, why is that? Because it's not a tax on everything. It's an effective carbon trading market. But given their party's lack of concern, their federal cousins with zero investment in climate, but Jade with, took us out of Kyoto yes, and are undermining efforts right now to get an international agreement in Paris. I would be pretty embarrassed if I was a hard carry conservative today, too, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you. I've got to, speaker, I have to go back to the Deputy Premier. The bottom line is that when costs go up for business, the cost of living goes up for everyone. Ontarians cannot afford another tax that will go to fund the scandal-plagued, mismanaged Liberal government. Liberal mismanagement in this province has already seriously affected the lives of all Ontarians. In my riding alone, we have a hospital in disarray for broken Liberal promises. We have seniors who can't afford diabetic test strips and families who cannot afford their hydro bill. And here you are. You're wanting to add another tax on them. This will be devastating to the people across the province. They can't afford your arrogance any longer. Deputy Premier, as the fourth of our five budget asks, will you commit in your 2015 budget not to levy another misguided Question. tax on the people of Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, let me share with the member what I think Ontarians can't afford. The residents of Goderich and her constituency can't afford another devastating tornado, Mr. Speaker. They can't afford it. The people in Burlington, Mr. Speaker, cannot afford to see their operating rooms wiped out by 100-year floods, two in 24 months. The member from Nepean Carleton is warned. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, apple farmers in Ontario and rural Ontario can't afford to lose 80% of their crop anymore, Mr. Speaker. People who get their drinking water from Lake Ontario can't afford to risk it going toxic, so they can't even boil it, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians can't afford more frequent ice storms, Mr. Speaker. Yes, People who ride GO Transit can't afford $600 million of damage in a one-hour storm, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. We can't afford. Thank you. Your question, the member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Deputy Premier. Today's Earth Day. It's a day to think about the environment, to think about sustainability and conservation. However, this government has had a problem sustaining its energy conservation programs. In 2010, the government cut the Ontario Home Energy Savings Program, which helped people reduce their heating bill with grants to retrofit their homes and make them more energy efficient. Since then, energy costs have skyrocketed. Speaker, why did this government Deputy cancel the important energy conservation home pro Good program? Good Thank you. The Minister Thank you. Of the member would know that uh, in our long-term energy plan of 2013, December, uh, conservation first is the overriding principle of that yeah. plan, Mr. Speaker. And he will also know, Mr. Speaker, that uh, throughout November and December this, uh, this past year, uh, every LDC, every utility across the province signed on to a new conservation framework, Good Mr. News. Speaker. It is a very, very extensive program, Mr. Speaker. It gives more authority to the local LDCs to initiate conservation NDP that is relevant that. to their particular communities, Mr. Speaker. We are conservation first. We're going to continue on that, and our projections are that it will be very, very extensive in terms of take-up, Mr. Great. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, this is a government that loves to make announcements. Loves it. But it's the follow-through that counts. Seven years ago, the government announced an agreement with Quebec to create a cap-and-trade system by January 2010. The NDP welcomed the announcement, but seven years later, we'll st we're still waiting. And, Speaker, I was there for the re-announcement, if that's their answer. In 2013, the government announced a plan to help homeowners conserve energy with on-bill financing for energy retrofits. Well, it's now 2015, and there is still no such program. Mr. Speaker, Will Ontarians have to wait another seven years for action on energy conservation, just as we have had to wait seven years on cap and trade? Good question. 
Minister. You should be deputy leader. Minister of the Environment. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, if you were listening to the question from your friends next door, you'll know, you'll know you won't have to wait very long for a carbon market, Mr. Speaker. Uh, second of all, we are doing unprecedented things right now, Mr. Speaker, in building standards and building codes. Thank you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing and his predecessors for initiating standards that are actually bringing down greenhouse gases and emissions. And we're just beginning, Mr. Speaker, because working with the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, the Minister of Economic Development, and the Minister of Energy, we are about to introduce some of the most most robust initiatives in reducing building-based greenhouse gas emissions, providing Ontarians with lower costs and heating their homes. I'm working closely with the Minister of Transportation, who is doing global leading work right now in the electrification of transit. We are making the biggest investments in public transit in the history of Ontario and some of the biggest in the history of North America, Mr. Speaker. You don't have to wait for a bus very long anymore, Mr. Speaker, Thank thanks to this government. No question. The member from Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Government and Consumer Services. And I think we can all agree that the spring weather that we're finally having and enjoying presents a welcome relief following the great winter that's just been passed. And as my constituents of Beaches East York are quick to remind me, but with spring comes a whole host of new responsibilities for homeowners. Yard maintenance, lawn care, seasonal cleaning, and other landscaping needs are all tasks that many homeowners are taking up with the use of service providers. Seasonal yard work important, is important and it creates valuable and opportunities for entrepreneurs and Ontario businesses. With the short term and the sometimes informal nature of these services, however, many of us are concerned and worry about the legitimacy of the agreements that are entered into with the service providers. Speaker, will the Minister of Government and Consumer Service address the concern and speak to how his ministry regulates home service contracts? Thank you, Minister of Government. And thank you, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Beaches East York for raising this important consumer protection issue. I agree that this type of seasonal work creates excellent employment opportunities. We also realize that with the rush to receive these services, consumers are vulnerable to entering into agreements with ambiguous or confusing terms, sometimes dictated over the phone. Agreements should be completed in person, and consumers should request a written estimate for the services they receive. And I strongly encourage all consumers not to commit to payments from a random sales call. If a company presents a good deal, consider the terms thoroughly and know that you're entitled to a written contract. Terms and conditions surrounding continuous services should be carefully reviewed. Providing clear contractual agreements for consumers speaker, is a priority, and our government continues to strengthen these uh, services for consumers. Thank you. Supplementary. Yes, thank you, Speaker. And I'm delighted by the response by the minister has given us about this very important area of concern for Ontario consumers. And we agree, and I agree, that lawn care companies make a unique and important contributions to our seasonal economy. It's how I got through university. And most Ontarios have either used such a company, worked for one, or they know somebody who would relied on the services in the past. So it's important that we instill confidence in Ontarians that their government is contributing to a fair and competitive marketplace. And I know, Speaker, that the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services has a strong history of enforcing fair consumer standards for Ontarians. And I tell my concerned constituents in Beaches East York that when they file complaints, they will receive decisive actions that will be taken up on their behalf. It's important that we protect the consumers at every stage Question. of these relationships. So can the Minister of Government and Consumer Services please speak to action the ministry has taken to protect consumers, specifically in dealing Thank with you. lawn care companies. Thank yes, you, uh, Speaker, and again to the member from uh, Beaches East York, and thank you for the question. Our ministry continues to monitor this issue closely and has taken action when necessary. In 2014, we received 124 complaints with regard to this particular issue, and uh, we've demanded that companies uh, are practicing uh, good and safe consumer practices with respect to providing contracts, written contracts for consumers. Uh, we've insisted uh, that uh, they cease to renew contracts if uh, they don't have the consent of the consumer. And I'm pleased with our track record in this area, and we're happy to act on these issues when they're brought to our attention uh, in the ministry. And, Speaker, you know, I'd say that with respect to these particular contracts, you should be, if you're uh, charged improperly for any type of service, immediately contacting the business, writing a letter and following up with yes, them. Sir. And if they refuse to act on that, to contact the ministry, and we'll be pleased to follow up and respond on behalf of the consumer. Thank you. New question. Mr. York Simcoe. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question
question is to the Deputy Premier. You've said that a mandatory Ontario pension plan would be good for the province, yet your own ministry has a, a document which supports the notion that 54,000 people will lose their jobs. The, uh, that's not the only. The people will have uh, reduced or eliminated their own existing pension plans. On behalf of Ontarians, the PC caucus has identified five key commitments we need to see from your budget or your government in order to support your budget. This is one. Premier, will you commit in your 2015 budget to saving jobs and abandoning the Ontario pension plan? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. I, uh, I want to remind some members that uh, there's a W behind their name. Deputy Premier. To the Associate Minister of Finance. Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker. And I want to thank the member opposite for this question. The implementation of the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, Mr. Speaker, is actually all about Ontario's future economy. Because we know that if people retire without adequate income in retirement, that has the potential to slow down consumption. If we have consumption that is slowed down, that could potentially slow down investments that are made in business, and that could hurt Ontario's economy. So our plan, which is to implement the ORPP for January 2017 is all about growing Ontario's economy because people will have an adequate income for life that they will spend into their retirement. That's good for business, that's good for Ontario's economy, and that's certainly good for our future retirees, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to being mindful Answer. of the impact of, on business, we're taking that into consideration as well, Speaker. Yeah, here. Thank you. Thank you. Point of order from the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to welcome members and staff of the Davenport Perth Neighbourhood and Community Health Centre's Civic Engagement Group to Queen's Park today. They were in attendance here at question period and will be touring the Legislative Assembly to learn about how government works. So welcome to that group. Thank you. Thank you. And from Newmark and Aurora, point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's not a point of order, but I would like to welcome students from Light of Christ Catholic School in Newmarket, Aurora. Actually, the member is absolutely correct. It is not a point of order to introduce, but I give a little leeway there. We have deferred vote on the motion of allocation of time on Bill 80, an act to amend the Ontario Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act and the Animals for Research Act with respect to the possession and breeding of orcas and administrative requirements for animal care. Call on the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
members please take their seats. All members please take your seats. On April 21st, Mr. Bradley moved government notice of motion number 20. All those in favor of the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. It should be song. Should be song. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jolinat. Madame Jolinat. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Manfa. Mr. Manfa. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes being 50 and the nays being 39, I declare the motion carried. The, there are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.